Hello everyone, great to be with you again at the uh, start of January uh, 2024. Uh, if you joined us last week, you will know that we always start off the new year by uh, freshly asking God to speak to us, to give us a word for the new year. And uh, if you did tune in, you'll know that the word that God's given us for uh, 2024 is from Ezekiel 37. And it's the famous story about the dry bones coming back to life. And it's really on the back of a prophetic word that was given to us by a visitor to Restore um, last October. Um, and he came into our old Alderston congregation and he just uh, shared the fact that he had Ezekiel 37 for us and uh, felt like God was speaking it to us in this season. And uh, he talked about the fact that over the last few years, we've done a reshaping, which we have, which was part of the bones coming together. You know the story in Ezekiel 37. I'll read a little bit of it at the moment, but you can read the whole passage a little bit later. But it starts with scattered bones, which represent the spiritual life of Israel, uh, where they're dry and, uh, and they've lost their connection. <clears throat> and it starts with the bones coming together to form the structure uh, for a body that is being created. And he talked about the fact that over the last few years, he sensed that we've been doing a restructuring as Restore, and uh, there'd been some pain in it, there'd been some loss in it, but it was like the bones coming together in a new shape for a new season. And then he talked about the fact that 2023, in lots of ways, had been a year that flesh had come on those bones which was the second part of the process from Ezekiel 37 in terms of the uh, sinews coming together, the muscles coming together, skin being put on the body and uh, the body being prepared really to come to life. And the word that he gave us that we felt was really, really significant for us for 2024 was that in 2024, it's, it's the, the year, it's going to be the year of activation and it's going to be the year that God breathes from heaven. And uh, you know at the end of, uh, of Ezekiel 37 in verse 9, uh, Ezekiel is told, Ezekiel whose name means God strengthens, he's told to prophesy that the breath of God will come on the body. And as he prophesies, then so the wind of God's spirit, so the breath of God does come on the body and the body starts to take form and starts to take sh shape and uh, becomes once again an army. And it's a picture of restoration for the nation of Israel. And he had a sense that in 2024, um, uh, God is one wanting to move in a fresh way across Restore by his spirit. And there'll be a, a, a divine, a supernatural acceleration of the life of God in and through us. And so that's the word that we're taking for 2024. And uh, we started over this last week with our first week of prayer and fasting in 2024. Excuse me, I'm just about to cough, but... <coughs> um, we did a week of prayer and fasting, and that was an opportunity to lay aside something, to lay down something that represents the power of us or the flesh in our lives, and to embrace something fresh of God's spirit. And so we had lots of opportunities to gather. It was great to be able to pray through the night on a Friday night at Woodford. Great opportunities just to engage with God uh, at the start of this new year and invite his spirit to come. And as I said last week, every first Wednesday of every month in 2024, we're going to make it a day of prayer and fasting across Restore. We're going to gather in the evening for a time of worship and pushing into his spirit because we're really uh, desperate. We want to cooperate with God for this year of activation and for the wind of his spirit to blow. And I said last week that over the next five weeks, we're going to take different elements from Ezekiel 37. We're going to track it through, going to track through the story bit by bit so that we can cooperate and do the work that needs to be done in preparation for the blowing of God's spirit to make sure we're in the right place, positioned in the right way, so that as the activating, as the supernatural presence of God comes and overtakes us, then God's able to achieve everything that he wants to do through us. And so we're going to start that process today by... Um, doing what I've called this week is understanding our context. Understanding our context or understanding our reality. And I'm going to speak from the first three uh, verses of Ezekiel 37. The first three verses of Ezekiel 37. So it's the start of the story. Let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Um, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And I've spent some time really meditating on this passage, um, but I've been really struck by these first three verses 
and by the starting point. And some things um, I noticed that I haven't noticed before, um, which are some of the things that I feel like the Lord's speaking us, particularly at this start of this year of activation, and some things that I thought were particularly important. Now, the first thing I want to say is it starts off in verse 1, and it says, The hand of the Lord was on me. The hand of the Lord was on me. And in fact, in three times in the book of Ezekiel, does he use the phrase, the hand of the Lord was on me. Uh, Firstly, it's the very start of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 3. He says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And then he starts his prophetic uh, ministry. Second time is in Ezekiel 33. If you uh, listen to the overview that I gave uh, last week, uh, chapters 1 through to 33 are the... uh, uh, words of judgment over Israel because they've fallen short of who God intended for them to be. And so at the end of that passage of of judgment in Ezekiel 33, again Ezekiel writes, the hand of the Lord was on me because God is about to begin the process of restoration. And then in Ezekiel 37, we find once more, the hand of the Lord is upon me. And that spoke to me really powerfully for a couple of reasons. Number one, I believe the hand of the Lord is on us. The hand of the Lord is on us. One of my favourite names for Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus said his uh, his, uh, first sermon in Matthew chapter 4 was, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. And uh, I like the terminology of that because that suggests we can reach out and touch the kingdom of God. But Jesus says, I bought the kingdom of God and it's within reach. And uh, and if the kingdom of God is within reach, then we can know the hand of the Lord being upon us. Maybe this morning you've tuned in. Maybe it's been a tough week for you. Maybe uh, Maybe it's been a tough season for you. Know this morning the hand of the Lord is on you. And the beginning of change is knowing the hand of the Lord is on you. Again, it reminded me of of Jesus, if his first sermon was the kingdom of God is at hand, so we can reach out and grab it. Um, His first sermon, first bit of scripture that he uh, quoted in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4, was Isaiah 61, which starts, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Jesus knew he was clothed, he was covered, he was empowered by God's Spirit. As we enter 2024, let's take some time to ensure that we know that God's hand is on us, that we are clothed and cloaked with his spirit. And we know that uh, salvation is by grace, it's not by works. And so uh, we're all unworthy of having the hand of the Lord on us, or the spirit of the sovereign Lord uh, anointing us. However, because of the work of the cross and the love of Jesus, When we say sorry to him, we can have our lives cleansed and we can start again. Paul writes, if anyone's joined to Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, in Corinthians. And so in the moment that we turn to Jesus and we experience our failings, our shortcomings being washed away, we come to the place that we know the hand of the Lord is on us. This last week, we've been doing prayer and fasting. Why? To ensure that we know that the hand of the Lord is upon us. And if the hand of the Lord is upon us, good things will always start to happen. If the hand of the Lord is upon us, good things will always begin to happen. So the passage starts with the hand of the Lord was upon me. It carries on and it says, He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, because he's being led by God's Spirit, as we want to be as sons of God, led by God's Spirit. He brought me out and set me in the middle of a valley. And I'd never really noticed before, I'd never really taken note before, that this whole story happens in a valley. And the significance of that is, particularly if you think about it in a uh, Middle Eastern context, a valley is a place where there's water and where there's fruitfulness and where there's life. And Israel had lost their hope. Uh, Israel had become like dried up bones. But there was water in the valley because the hand of the Lord was on them. And it just struck me again, it reminded me once more, that valleys are a place of fruitfulness. And a valley is a low place. 
And I think often we uh, struggle. And like, who, if I said to you this morning, who wants to come to a low place with me? I bet we wouldn't have a great uh, queue. If I said, who wants to come to a high place with me? Uh, we'd probably have a, a lot more enthusiastic people. But actually, the place of formation and transformation is often in the low place in the valley. But it's in the valley that we find the river of God, and it's the river of God that begins the process of bringing fruitfulness. I'm struck, um, I've often been struck by uh, Psalm 23, uh, which we know well. Um, but it talks about death in Psalm 23, and it talks about uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And I've always been struck by the fact that it talks about walking through the valley, walking through death or the shadow of death as being like a valley, which actually says, well, one, God is with us because it goes on and it says, your rod and your staff comfort me. So we're walking through a journey of grief and loss. But it also, because it happens in a valley, it can actually be something that brings transformation. And I think as I've been reflecting on this, I've just been um, aware again that transformation requires us to face our shortcomings. And it's in the facing of our shortcomings that we then invite God's Spirit to come and bring change in us. But if we never admit, or we never recognize, or we never come face to face with our shortcomings, maybe we'll never see transformation. And I think part of the problem of today's culture is we try to protect ourselves from hardship. And because we have, uh, compared to the rest of the world anyway, um, a level of affluence, uh, we're able to, um, tr as much as we uh, can, cocoon ourselves from hardship. So we've got a roof over our head and we've got food on our table and uh, we've got things that we can uh, comfort ourselves with, be it chocolate or binge watching or any of those kind of things. The danger of that is whenever we start to go into a valley, we just comfort ourselves and try and escape from it and try and get the pain taken away. But what if the pain is part of God stirring something to bring up to the surface some of the things that we need change and transformation in? What if we actually need to sit in the discomfort to then hear God speak, to then cooperate with God, in the process of change. And what really struck me from this passage is, um, it says, the hand of the Lord was on me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, brought me to the middle of a valley. So this is going to be a fruitful place. If you are in a valley season right now, God has fruit that he wants to bring from it. Psalm 23 doesn't end with, um, uh, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, it goes on and talks about you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me. He comes, the psalmist comes to a place of fruitfulness out of a place of pain. If you're in a place of pain this morning, it can be the beginnings of a journey into transformation and fruitfulness. But the very next thing the Spirit of God does is it says in verse 2, he led me back and forth among the bones. The end of verse 1 says the, the valley was full of bones. Verse 2, it says, he led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And what struck me as unusual in this passage is quite often I take one look at something and I think, oh, it's a valley of dry bones. Okay, God, what are you going to do now? But for Ezekiel, God didn't just look, let him take a quick look at it. The Spirit of God led Ezekiel on a journey, so he took a look and said, it's the Valley of Dry Bones. And then God made him, as he led him by a spirit, walk around the dry bones. And he had to see and examine and sit in the midst of all of the dry bones. And actually, as Ezekiel goes through that process, he comes at the end of verse 2 and says, not just dry bones, he says these bones are very dry. And so actually, Ezekiel is having to encounter the debris and the pain 
of everything that has been lost for the nation of Israel. And not just take a quick glimpse at it and then go away and eat his bar of chocolate and feel a little bit better. Um, He actually has to sit, be confronted by it, look at it closely, and really engage the fullness of the devastation. And in verse 11, um, Ezekiel later on says, or God says to Ezekiel, these bones are the people of Israel. Uh, um, They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. And Ezekiel has to encounter the depth of loss, dryness, despair, absence of hope before he sees God start to bring transformation. And I wonder whether one of the reasons that we don't see the transformation we want to see is because we're not actually brave enough to sit in the midst of the debris and the pain and the brokenness of what we're really feeling. I've been on a process recently. We've, um, you know our story. We've had a lot of things that have been tough to navigate the last few years. Um, just before Christmas, I had uh, maybe my, uh, one of my toughest moments in that. And um, that's hard. And I was speaking to uh, one of my friends, a guy that I trained with when I first trained for ministry, so over 30 years ago, um, uh, I, I worked alongside him. And uh, I happened to be on a Zoom call with him. We've decided in this next season we're going to connect regularly with one another. Um, and uh, he's now um, doing pastoral work um, in the church that he's in, in, in Coventry. And he was just saying to me, he said, the thing that I've learned most through the years in pastoral work is that most people want to escape their pain and God normally wants you to live in it just a little bit longer than you're comfortable living in it. And he said, and the reason why I've learned that's significant, it's in the moments of discomfort that we start to deal with the real issues that underlie what's going on in our hearts and our lives. And if we rush away too quickly, or we help people out too quickly, we actually don't do them a favour because we stop them engaging in the very depths at the very core of who they are. And I knew when he said it, I knew God was speaking to me. And actually the next week we had a really tough situation. And um, I was aware as I was in the midst of it and all the pain, that it was like I was sitting in the middle of dry bones. And because he'd spoken that, I thought, do you know, I'm going to make a decision not to rush away from this. I'm going to make a decision actually to sit and see it. And where there's disappointment, and where there's confusion, where there's heartbreak, where there's pain, I'm going to name it. I'm going to be brave enough to see it. And then I'm going to offer it to God for transformation. And I felt like God was saying, for us as Restore in 2024, God doesn't want us just to replay some of the steps we've taken in the past to hopefully crawl us out the valley. He actually wants to bring real deep life transformation. But for some of us, it'll come from being prepared to sit in the midst of the debris and the pain and the disappointment, and the hurt, and the heartbreak. Ezekiel, I don't think, would have seen the transformation he'd seen if he hadn't been willing, under the guidance of the Spirit of God, to review the debris in front of him and really take ownership of it. And it's interesting, in the middle of that, that God then speaks and says, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's response is really interesting, isn't it? Because as he encounters the depth of the hopelessness and the devastation, it's like God says, do you believe this can come back to life? And Ezekiel's response is, I don't know. And do you know that's okay? Because if the bones are really going to come to life, it's not going to come to life out of Ezekiel's good plan and good efforts. It's going to come to life 
because God does something supernatural. And it's okay for Ezekiel to be the, at the end of himself. It's okay for Ezekiel to feel like he has nothing to offer. It's okay for Ezekiel to sit in the midst of a broken community. And Ezekiel's response is, you alone know. And what we need to do at the start of a year of activation, if we have broken dreams, broken hurts, places where we've experienced heartbreak, our first point is surrendering it to God. Because what Ezekiel does is he, in effect, surrenders. It reminded me of of, um, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know the word Gethsemane means olive oil press. And it's the place that olives used to be squeezed or pressed so that the uh, oil would flow from them. And Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane goes through the pressing, the squeezing of, am I really willing to go through crucifixion? Am I really willing to go through the cross? And as Jesus wrestles with God, he comes to the point of, but God, not my will, but yours be done. And he comes to a point of total surrender. And what Ezekiel does at the start of this passage is he sees all the devastation of Israel. As a prophet, he will have carried God's heart and God's compassion. And even when he prophesied God's judgment in the first half of the uh, book of Ezekiel, he will have done it with love and with an ache in his heart and a heartbreak. And Ezekiel sits in the middle of all of that heartbreak. He lets God bring him face to face with it so he can then surrender to God and say, God, now I need you. God, these bones can live, but it needs to be you. God, I can't do it. It needs to be you. And that becomes the beginning point of transformation. And for many of us, I think the beginning point of our transformation, the beginning point of our heartbreak, becoming a valley that becomes a place of fruitfulness. The beginning point is that point of surrender, that point of letting everything go. I'm reminded again of um, the story of Lazarus and Jesus raising him from the dead. And one of the things that often um, uh, kind of challenges me in that story is that Lazarus died and they sent word to Jesus. And then Jesus waited another two days And so he didn't rush to get to Lazarus' tomb. And in in one sense, maybe that wasn't surprising. It was because he he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. And so it didn't matter if he'd been dead for a couple of days or a couple of days more. Um, What it did mean was that when they opened the tomb for Jesus to raise him from the dead, it stank. And maybe Jesus waited because the community needed to experience the stench of the pain of death to really then appreciate the value of resurrection. And I wonder if that's a bit like Ezekiel, smelling the stench of not just dry bones, but very dry bones. And that also reminded me me then of the journey that a caterpillar takes from being a caterpillar to becoming a butterfly. And uh, there's some great YouTube videos you can watch on it, actually. It's very therapeutic to do in your quiet moments. Um, But you probably know a caterpillar um, eats as much as it can, so it prepares its body, grows its body, getting ready for the next stage of transformation into becoming a butterfly. But then, uh, when it's full and ready for that, it finds a place of safety under a leaf, normally, and it hangs down and it sheds its outer skin and it forms a chrysalis. And then when the hard chrysalis, protective chrysalis is formed around it, it then reduces literally to mush. Everything dissolves within it. It then sits in that mush for a while and then there's a realignment and a readjustment and a butterfly starts to form. And interestingly enough, when it's ready to come out, it has to force its way out of the outer shell to start to see the world and then be able to fly. And they say if you help, if you help a butterfly out, you actually destroy its ability to fly because it's the tension and the stress of forcing its way out of the, the shell, the cocoon, that actually then enables it to have the strength for its uh, wings to be fully form- formed and it to be able to fly. 
But I was struck again that for that transformation to happen, the caterpillar has to die, but it has to be willing to have, to kind of go into meltdown. And sometimes we have to hit a place of meltdown to really deal with the issues that we need to really deal with for them to be able to, God then to be able to break in and bring transformation. I think often our paradigm for discipleship should be much more, I get hit by a wall that stops me because God wants to change something in me. I then cooperate with God in the process of change. I carry on and I get hit by another wall or another trauma or another obstacle. And again, I need to cooperate with God. God, what is this bringing up in me? God, what is this showing me about the way that I'm living? God, what do I need to learn from this? And instead of just pushing away, God, I don't like it. God, this hurts. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death and we invite God to start to bring change. I really, really believe that 2024 is going to be a year of transformation, a year of activation, a year of divine acceleration. But I think those of us who are going to really experience that are going to be the ones that are brave enough to confront what's currently in our hearts. And in particular, where there's broken hopes, broken dreams, pains, grief, debris from the past, where there's bones that aren't how they ought to be, just to be willing to sit in the middle of them with the Spirit of God, because no, the Spirit of God was with Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was on him. So he brought God into it. Don't ever just sit in your debris without the presence of God, because that won't do you any good. But we need to sit in our debris. But as we sit in our debris, we need to invite the Spirit of God to come. And it will be the pathway, the beginning, the first step into the process of transformation. I just want to take a moment to... Um, pray and just to reflect really on what God is speaking through it. When I was preparing this whole series I felt like this week was maybe the one out of all the weeks that was most significant for us to take note of and I do feel like there's something about a patterning culture that tries to escape pain whereas God uses pain to get our attention and then to have the potential to bring transformation. Lord, I pray right now, and I pray for everyone watching, that in these moments, Lord, we might be brave enough to be honest about where our hearts are at and where our lives are at. And Lord, my guess is that many of us have had battles and struggles over the last few years. Many of us have had bruises and rips in our hearts. Maybe even now, some of us are sitting in the midst of what feels like debris. Lord, in these moments, Lord, I want to open up my heart to you. I want to open up my life to you. I want to open up my pain to you. And Lord, into the places that the bones of my life, my heart, have become dried up and the hope has been lost, into the places where I've become disconnected, where I'm out of shape. I just want to bring, Lord, every bit of that and all the emotions connected to it. And I pray, Lord, let your hand rest on me in the midst of this place. May your spirit be with me in the midst of this place. And Lord, I surrender the pain, the brokenness. I surrender it to you. Can these bones live? Lord, you know. You know. And Lord, I pray that this year, 2024, 
It will be the year of resurrection. Thank you, this story is about what was dead and seemed beyond possibility of ever coming back to life again. It became a pathway to resurrection. And Lord, I pray over the debris in all of our lives, over the shattering in all of our hearts. And I pray, Lord, in this season, let there be a coming together. Let there be a reconnecting, a realignment. Let there be fresh flesh coming on it. And let the breath of your spirit start to bring us into resurrection life and resurrection power. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining with us today. I would actually encourage you, if God's spoken to you today, to uh, think about replaying this over the next few days and uh, find some time and space where you can just sit in the debris, sit in the pain, sit in uh, some of the hurt and invite the Spirit of God into it. Also, if you'd like someone to pray with you, we want to do this as family together, then uh, please email info at restorecc.org.uk, info at restorecc.org.uk. We can email me, ian.king at restorecc.org.uk. Any members of the Restore team, you can uh, uh, put their uh, Christian name, dot surname, at restorecc.org.uk. Let's journey together into this next season of fruitfulness that God has for you. May God bless you.